Morning, everyone. Good morning. My background uh, is as an engineer. I was trained as an engineer back in the late 70s. Um, not long after that, uh, I went through university. I did a degree in the history and philosophy of science. And at the end of that, around the end of the 80s, I got quite interested in this question about climate and uh, have sort of followed things ever since. And being an engineer, also interested in energy. And energy obviously underpins our industry. And also the way we produce energy underpins the price that people have to pay to keep their homes warm and to run their vehicles and so on. So it's a very, very important issue. It's one that's a Cinderella issue. It always seems to get left behind in big policy debates at the national level. UKIP needs to tie energy discussion to other issues in order to get people to think about it more. I'm not going to talk for too long about climate science, because we pretty much know what the opinion of it is in this room. Um, the current state of knowledge basically is too uncertain to make energy policy with. And Nigel Farage made this point the first time I ever went to see him speak. He said we need to separate these two issues. The climate question won't be solved for a long time, but we need to sort out the energy issue, and he's absolutely right about that. So, as you can see, the model in red running away. We've seen this graph already this morning, running away from the actual observations. And so, when your own data and models don't add up, censorship is never a good look. At the end of 2013, uh, I was one of the editors of um, uh, a scientific journal called Pattern Recognition in Physics. We did a special edition where myself and about two dozen other scientists around the world that I'm in touch with, we put together a special issue outlining a new theory uh, about how climate is actually controlled by the motion of the planets in the solar system and the way they affect solar variation and the rate the Earth spins at and some other details. Um, the IPC, and it, it came to one very basic conclusion, I won't go into the science, but, uh, but basically the sun controls our climate and it's the motion of the planets that controls the solar variation. And what that means is, because we know where the planets are going to be in the future, we can make a prediction of what's going to happen with solar activity. And uh, where we are now is sort of where the blue curve ends, and the next 100 years or so, <coughs> solar activity is going to be, we believe, significantly lower than it has been. And this means that rather than seeing any great warmth <coughs> An increasing warmth from extra CO2, we're actually quite likely to see a cool down. Now, we put that in the conclusions of our journal, and 20 days later, the IPCC got the journal shut down. So, the kind of red and blue debate uh, that Peter talked about that we need um, doesn't look like it's going to happen. We tried that back in 2011 in Lisbon, uh, and the other side refused to show up and talk to us. So, you can somehow got to get this up the agenda because, because, it's going to get, because it's very likely going to get colder, people are going to need more heating, that means more energy, and we need reliable energy, and we're not going to get that with wind turbines. So, roughly equivalent to 87 big wind turbines occupying five square miles would be one shale gas pad occupying a space about the size of a couple of football fields. Yeah. So, as was already mentioned uh, earlier on uh, by, by John Mosley, gas is the way to go because it's pretty clean. And, uh, and the Americans have gone ahead with lots of fracking for gas. They're the only major country that's really cut its CO2 emissions, even though they, weren't, they never signed up to Kyoto. Um, so we need to look at where we're at because North Sea production, as you can see, uh, peaked in around the, the turn of the millennium and has been dropping away ever since. And so we need to fill this gap pretty sharpish. And that means um, sinking some shale wells on shore, getting the gas out and using it because it's a clean fuel. It will bridge us between now and when we develop a a better, even cleaner technology like fusion or, or a, a different kind of nuclear energy using thorium rather than uranium. Mm -hmm. you know, but those things are probably a few decades away. We need to use shale gas in the meantime as, as the best bridge to, uh, to that. So we need to go the high energy route with Trump. 
And, uh, you know, the, the media's tried to fry him and his political opponents have tried to fry him. It's been out of date, this cartoon on the right, because he's already beaten Hillary, so let's just update that. Paris Climate Accord. He's pulled out. And you can see the celebs are in tears. The media's really pissed off about it. The climate skeptics like me, we're pretty happy because this is a vindication and validation of what we've been saying for years. Now, what we've got to move on to in UKIP is to grasp the nettle of, about fracking. And as Julia said right at the start of this, we need to get on this years ahead of the next general election after this one. So we've got time to educate the public and talk to them about fracking, that it is the best option uh, so that we can develop uh, a sensible, joined up energy policy for Britain, which connects other issues in that people are concerned about. So if we're going to talk about um, an energy policy that, that's joined up to other policies, we can say that if, you know, we want an end really to, we don't, we don't want to be a hostage to fortune to the EU importing gas from Russia and then us having to buy it off the EU because it's coming through their end of the continent. You know, so that's one reason why we need to be producing our own gas from under our own soil. Um, we don't really want to be involved in any more Middle East conflicts. We've seen what that leads to last night and two weeks ago and three months ago. And, you know, the long term solution to that is to gradually unwind and withdraw from our involvement in Middle East conflicts. So fracking is for peace and security. And I think that a lot of ordinary people could see the sense in that if we explain it to them carefully. So we also need to reform the Climate Change Act, which says that we have to reduce our CO2 emissions 50% by 2030. Um, it's complete pie in the sky lunacy. We'd have to shut down our economy to do that. But it's written into law. We're the only country in the world which actually made it a law that we have to kneecap our own economy and commit economic suicide. So we have to get our new science findings that were suppressed by the IPCC back on the agenda. We need to show people that there is two sides to this climate argument, even though the BBC um, in 2005 with their panel of interested experts decided that they wouldn't treat the skeptics fairly and give them any uh, airtime. Uh, we've got to push for change on that. We've got to have that blue and red debate and we've got to um, change the targets for CO2 reduction in light of the new scientific findings such as our findings about the effect of the sun on Earth's climate being much bigger than the effect of any trace gases in the atmosphere. So if we make progress with that then we can end the subsidies for wind and solar because they're no longer justified and that means we can end the green taxes on energy bills mm -hmm. and this is the sensible way to reduce people's energy bills rather than putting caps on uh, what the power companies can charge because that's trying to that's trying to bash the symptom instead of dealing with the cause and that's only going to cause more problems with failing infrastructure and, and lack of investment so we have to go for the, the root cause which is the CCA and get that changed and end the green taxes on energy bills so when we start doing this fracking of course we can do what Norway did we can set up a sovereign wealth fund and we can ask people to, um, who, who are taking up fracking permits or producing gas, uh, they'll have to pay a proportion of, of the proceeds of doing that into a sovereign wealth fund. And then we can use, we can say that the receipts from that will be spent in the UK only. So it won't go in foreign aid, and we can use it to invest in jobs and clean modern infrastructure. Uh, we can invest in giving kids uh, apprenticeships in engineering so that we can build our own fracking industry around our own capabilities with our own engineering industry rather than importing the teams in from the states to do it in a hurry. Um, we can build up that industry at a sensible pace. We can show the public that in fact it can be done safely and cleanly and it can generate a lot of wealth for this country and a lot of high quality jobs for our young people. So we need to invest in jobs and clean modern infrastructure to underpin, underpin a Brexit manufacturing renaissance. We can't rely on the money jugglers in London forever. We're going to need to get back to what we were, which is a fantastic, superb, world-class engineering nation. And so that's my real message to everybody here today, is that we need to 
join up the policy to other issues, join it up to good, good education and good training for young people, join it up to ending terrorism. If we can get people to understand how energy policy is linked to these other major issues, then we can get people to pay more attention to it and take up realistic solutions. Thank you for your attention.